How was everybody's weekend? Yeah, how was yours? It was not rest, restful weekends don't exist anymore when you have kids and t-ball up here because you have to get a certain number of games in a certain number of weeks. It really makes that hard. So I spent six hours at the ball fields this weekend because I have two kids in, in Little League. So that was it was a lot of fun, but it's also you know exhausting to do that with a one and a half year old who wants to get into everything. You should just let him go outside. We we try to just let him do his own thing, but you know there's metal bats flying around, baseballs flying around. It becomes a safety issue. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Let me. Where they're all showing up twice. <laughs> Oh, all right so general just what we're going to do today i'm going to go ahead and assume that most of you are still a little shaky on ph given that we got to that but just barely and it involves logs and logs are scary um so what we're going to do today is since since we have a fair number of weeks left to get through, not that much more material left, we can take our time with pH and these concentration problems. Um, so that's what we're gonna do today is get some practice. And then on uh, your lab this week is going to be a, um, an acid-base reaction where we're gonna measure the pH using an indicator. You guys use that, the indicator turns, goes from colorless to pink um, when you took chemistry before going to be, if you haven't, it's not a big deal. We'll talk about indicators and, and this process, which is called the titration. Um, titration basically just means you're going to add small amounts of one reactant to an, an unknown amount of the other reactant until you get to the point where they just barely cancel each other out. And then we can use stoichiometry to figure out how many moles um, of our unknown were there to begin with. So, but like I said, we'll get lots of practice today um, and then I'll introduce it. We'll do some practice problems on Wednesday and then you'll do your titrations on Thursday with Tom's. Um, all right, some good random quiz questions. I'm still working my way through the quiz from what's now two weekends ago. Um, I'm most of the way done with them, but there's some good random questions and some good um, relevant questions. So we'll go through those real quick. Are two atoms of the same element identical? Mm, kind of. What's identical about any two atoms of the same element? Number of protons. And if they have the same charge, the number of electrons. What could be different though? Neutrons. So if we amend this question to say, are any two atoms of the same isotope? identical then the answer is yes we can't tell the difference between from one hydrogen atom to another hydrogen atom um, chemically mathematically they're identical unless they're different isotopes um, and even chemically even the same different isotopes react the same chemically which opens the door for some really interesting um, research in um, well, in a lot of fields but we see it the most in biochemistry they do what'll call what are called isotopic studies, where you do something like you, you feed a cell um, glucose where all of the hydrogens are actually hydrogen two, deuterium. And then you see what other molecules in the cell wind up having deuterium in them. And you can actually figure out how the process of breaking down glucose to form ATP works just by looking at, okay, well, glucose 
um, is the only thing that has deuterium in it originally. But then after 15 minutes, there's a whole bunch of this molecule called pyruvate that has a bunch of deuterium in it. So what, from that, we can say that pyruvate must be made of some of the pieces of the glucose that we gave it. Otherwise, why would the deuterium be showing up? And so they can do these process, these experiments where they basically track through the cell um, what different intermediates exist or what compounds are tied to what other compounds by tracking when, where the different isotopes show up. Um, but you can't track individual atoms unless uh, and tell them apart from other atoms unless there's something different about them. And that one thing that's different that we can do that doesn't change the chemistry of it is the isotopes. We can change what isotope we're dealing with without changing much about the chemical reactivity. Um, this next one is going with that, that idea that Benjamin Franklin got it wrong. He messed up our charges. He, he just switched which, which one he called the positive, which one he called the negative. Then we'd have positively charged electrons and negatively charged protons, which sounds backwards. But on the other hand, it would also make so that we could say, oh, I lost an electron. Therefore, my charge went down. It would make a lot more sense that way. Right. Um, so why haven't we fixed that? Basically, because between when Benjamin Franklin first defined charge as positive and negative and when they figured out what an electron was and what a proton was, about almost a hundred years had passed and so much research had been done and everybody had gotten so used to that system that it would have basically, they would need to like erase a hundred years of research and rewrite it all um, so that the charges made sense. And there just was never enough momentum to, to change that. Or I guess I should say there was too much momentum to keep it the way it was. And so we deal with the fact that losing an electron means you gain charge um, because, and, and it actually gets more annoying if you take calculus and calc-based physics, because when you do things like um, integrate under a curve, if you actually want to find the energy under, um, from, a, from a certain process, when you integrate, you wind up with a random negative that shows up in the middle of your math. And, the, and that's because the charge is backwards, um, but not a whole lot of push to change it. And now it's even more firmly ingrained. So we're just going to have to continue to deal with that and get used to it. And that's just a weird idiosyncrasy of, of how science, as we have as we research it on Earth, we were starting from scratch. We would absolutely define it the opposite way. In fact, there's a common joke among physicists of like, you know, physicists with a, with a meme or with a time machine would go back and find Ben Franklin. Like, no, 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 stop. You're getting it wrong. Switch those two. Um, because then everything would make sense. But we'd have to go all the way back to the beginning to do that. Um, why do we get more moles and birthmarks on our skin as we get older? Because that's all skin damage. Um, your skin is damaged. It's damaged by sunlight and UV light. And just being exposed to oxygen and the continuous process of cells, skin cells dividing and going through mitosis, there are just inherently some places where your skin cells tend to mess up sometimes. And most of those don't have any effect. If there's mutations, most of the time, you don't see any noticeable effects. So it's called a silent mutation. Um, and then out of the, you know, 1% of mutations that aren't silent mutations, most of those form fairly harmless um, skin issues like moles or birthmarks or wrinkles, um, things like that. Um, and about, but about 1% of the non-silent mutations also form melanomas. Um, so that's why you wind up with some, some moles wind up being harmless, some moles are cancerous. It's all kind of just luck and genetic predis predisposition and exposure to, to sun and light in general and just existing all lead to, you know, increased chance of cancer. Basically, if you live long enough, even if you avoid sunlight, um, you're going to get cancer at some point. It's basically an inevitability based on on the way our biochemistry works. Um, does anybody want to guess what the number one carcinogen in the world in the history of mankind is? That'd be a good guess. That's number two. Number one is oxygen. Um, 
if you, by breathing oxygen and breaking down oxygen in your cells, you produce peroxides, which can have a probability of turning into free radicals. Free radicals cause cell damage. And if that happens in the wrong part of your cell, you get cancer mutation. So just by breathing and existing, you're exposing yourself to a carcinogen. Um, so you're basically guaranteed at some point, if you live long enough, you will get cancer. It's just a matter of getting lucky and not getting it too early and avoiding the, the um, dangers, you know, the increased probabilities as much as you can to some extent. Um, you don't want to avoid all sunlight, right? Because that's not healthy either. So it's about balancing risk factors. Um, but I always like to use that as a good example. Avoid like you know, say smoking, things like that are, that are obviously bad for you. Tons of really bad carcinogens. But don't worry too much about staying out of all sunlight because you're still breathing oxygen, right? Can't get rid of that. So might as well uh, enjoy the sun. Uh, Last, so one random question and one that's kind of related to what we've talked about. Is time travel theoretical, theoretically possible? Um, in theory, yes. According to Stephen Hawking, and I trust that guy, well, oh. for the most part, um, Stephen Hawking tells me, I don't, I can't do the math myself or haven't been able to do the math for a number of years. It's been a long time since I had to do this math. Um, but in theory, it's possible to, to basically rearrange the curvature of space-time such that you connect it something that's further forward in time with something further back in time. Um, basically doing something like making a wormhole. Who's seen Interstellar? You, the whole idea with the piece of paper and you put a hole in it and you connect two parts of the paper that were further apart. That works for physical space. That same logic works for time because time behaves mostly like a physical dimension. Um, so in theory, you could make a wormhole that goes back in time. But it would, in doing so, you would actually cause some really weird curvature in space time in a way that, that um, basically if you build a time machine and turn it on, you could never go back in time further than when the first time machine was invented, which seems like a weird loop paradox. But basically, if you built the right machine that caused the right distortions, you could make it so that people from the future could come back to that point, but no further. Which is weird and kind of maybe sounds like a time travel paradox, and maybe it is a little bit, but again. Stephen Hawking has a whole chapter on it, and it's pretty interesting. He wrote, he wrote a really good book that was released um, posthumously um, called, uh, I think it was called Brief Answers to the Big Questions or something like that. And he talks about, like, as, a, as Stephen Hawking, what are the number one questions he gets at, asked all the time and what's his answer? And time travel was one of them. It's a really good book um, if you want to know how Stephen Hawking thinks. Um, it makes more sense the more physics you've had, but even if you have only had high school physics, it's still readable. Um, for the most part, you just kind of have to take his word when he says some things are possible um, if you don't have the science background yet. Um, but that's always a fun question. I like getting that question too, because I get to plug this book then too. Um, last but not least, why do combustion reactions always produce CO2 and water? Because that's kind of the definition of a combustion reaction. A combustion reaction is anything that starts with carbon um, and hydrogen, usually and hydrogen, and you produce the fully oxidized form of carbon as a result. So if you start with carbon that's not fully oxidized and you end with carbon that's fully oxidized, the fully oxidized form of carbon is CO2. So if you take carbon, any carbon, and take it all the way to its most oxidized state, you get CO2. So that's just kind of the, def the definition of a combustion reaction is you're fully oxidizing carbon, um, which I've now said the same thing three different ways because I don't really know how, any more ways to say it's just the definition of it. Um, you can have other things that show up. The reason we have catalytic converters in, our, um, in uh, cars that burn gas still is because that full oxidation doesn't always necessarily happen. Really, you wind up with a whole range of other random carbon-based stuff um, that's not necessarily fully oxidized. And so that's what we 
Um, if you're if you have a campfire and you produce smoke, most of that smoke is unburnt fuel, is fuel that didn't get fully oxidized. So you get a whole bunch of other random crap. Um, mixed in with your CO2 and water when you burn gasoline and catalytic converters kind of allow more complete combustion to happen, basically, which limits some of these other products that get um, from getting released out the tailpipe of the car. Um, but if you have if you have a fuel source that has some sulfur in it, which is pretty common in organic in biochemical matter, uh, having small amounts of sulfur, then you get stuff like sulfur dioxide, you get a fully oxidized form of sulfur mixed in there. If it's something that has lots of nitrogen, you get nitrogen um, dioxide or dinitrogen trioxide. And all of these different um, other byproducts are why different, this is less true now, but back in the 80s, especially in the 90s, before catalytic converters were mandatory, you could actually identify a city by the color of the smog um, that was over that city because different cities got their gasoline from different refineries in different crude and the different crude had different amounts of sulfur or nitrogen or whatever else mixed in. And so if you had like a yellowy haze, that was, that was indicative of nitrogen being present in the fuel source. And if you had sulfur, then it was indicative of, of uh, more of a, like a grayish color um, in the smoke. And so if you see old pictures of smog from the, from the eighties um, and seventies to that, to some extent, that's, Basically, all just incomplete combustion happening. Other things that are showing up. That's why modern um, modern refineries do their best to remove all of the sulfur and nitrogen before they produce um, the gasoline. It's part of the treatment process to limit that issue. All right, more relevant questions. Could a reaction be classified as two different types under each category, like complexation? then precipitation or precipitation and acid base? Absolutely. Um, we're looking at the most general cases right now, but you can, out of those four main reaction types that we've talked about, you can mix and match, mix and match a little bit. Um, and base, there are others that are kind of similar that we have not even taken into account uh, as well. So we're just starting at the bare bones at the foundational level, but where there's a lot more complicated reactions that can occur where you wind up linking together multiple reactions. Um, and when you take Jen again, we get to talk about that. Um, what exactly is an oxidation, oxidizing agent? It's just, it, like I said, it's anything that, that causes an oxidation to happen is an oxidizing agent. So anything that really wants to be reduced is going to be a good oxidizing agent. And any, but really anything that can be reduced at all is an oxidizing agent under the right circumstances. Um, how do we identify bases if, if we don't have hydroxide? How do, how do we do that? If we have the full reaction written out, that's not too bad, right? We look at whatever gained in H plus, right? But if you don't have the re full reaction written out, if I just said H2O plus ammonia, and I tell you it's an acid-base reaction, how do you know whether water is the acid or water is the base? We could write this the products two different ways, right? What would it look like if um, if water was the acid? What would our products be? So if the if water gives up an H plus, then what's left is hydroxide and NH3. If you throw an extra H plus onto it, we do have a name for that's polyatomic ion that was on our list, right? NH4 plus. So if I tell you what the acid is and what the base is, we can wreck, we can finish this, but what's the other possibility? If water acts as the base instead of the acid, then we get H3O plus and
Was this one on your list of, of ions? It's on the Gen Chem list, so I wasn't sure. Um, NH2 with a, with a um, minus charge is called amide. Um, but basically, we don't necessarily know at this point, you don't have the background to know which of these is more likely. Um, and so in general, I will do something. If I asked you to complete this reaction, I would do it kind of the way we did it here. I'd say water and ammonia react together in acid-base reaction. Water is the base or water is the acid. And then have you finish the rest of it. But I'd give you that information. Um, both in this case, these two um, reactants in general are tricky because they're, they both could be an acid and they both could be a base. Um, and the word for that type of uh, compound is called it's, it's I want to say it's amphoteric. Basically, it can accept a proton or it can give up a proton. And to know which of them is more likely, you need to know which of them is the better base or which of them is the better acid. And we'll have, we'll give you ways of ranking these acids once we get a, pra a little more practice with acid-base reactions and pH. But basically we have, we have ways of establishing um, as a ranking acid strength. Whichever one is a stronger acid means it's also the weaker base. So the stronger acid will act as the acid and the other one acts as the base in a case like that. Then last but not least, I know I've said this out loud, but I wanted to put the links in here. If you're looking for more resources, more practice problems, more um, explanation, my two favorite YouTube channels to recommend for people that want to hear the same concept presented in different words are Khan Academy and Professor Dave Explains. Khan Academy, uh, I'm not sure if I told the story yet, but Khan Academy literally got its start um, because Sal Khan was trying to tutor his niece in chemistry from across the country and started, started making YouTube videos. Um, and then they took off and she started, his niece started sharing them with their classmates and so on. So especially for Ochem, because that's what he was trying to tutor her. It's all, but Gen Chem as well, it's kind of, that is in Sal Khan's wheelhouse from the very beginning, they've been really strong at chemistry. So Khan Academy is super helpful. Um, Professor Dave is a, uh, is a former PhD student. I assume he finished his PhD, but basically. Welcome to Professor Dave Explains. Um, he's a goofy guy who makes funny animations and also explains things really well. He's got a whole playlist on everything from um, physics and astronomy, chemistry, um, gen chem, ochem, et cetera, et cetera. You would just want to start with the gen chem one. Um, biology gets into pharmaceuticals, he gets into talking about a lot modern philosophy. Um, guy's just really good at explaining things and he puts out lots and lots of videos. Um, he does have a tendency to get involved in, in online debates and flame wars with flat earthers and creationists, but who has done that from time to time, right? Um, but he has, it's a really, if, you're, if you really want to see a good um, debunking of flat earth theory, not that it should be necessary in this day and age, but that's a separate issue. Um, if you want to see a good playlist debunking flat earth theory, he's got that, got you handled there too. Um, and explaining how various other, um, call them controversial science topics that shouldn't be controversial, like evolution and young earth creationism. Um, if you have, if you want to see just really well well done, broken down explanations for why certain ideas like that um, don't hold water scientifically. He's a great place to go. Um, let's I'll go back to the other. Uh, no, that's the wrong topic. Hang on. Lost the mouse. Okay. There we go. All right. But even basic stuff like explaining chemical re or balancing chemical reactions, explaining what redox reactions are, Professor Dave's great too. Um, super entertaining to watch as well. All right. 
Any other random questions or questions about redox reactions or anything before we get into more practice with pH? Not just hang on to them, ask another time. <clears throat> All right, here's where we ended up the other day, right? On Friday, this was what you were supposed to do over the weekend instead of having a quiz. And I know everybody remembered to do this, right? Nobody just took this as a weekend off and, and totally didn't think about it all weekend. That's not what chemistry students do. So I know nobody did that. Um, all right, so assuming that some of you may have worked through it and some of you may have not, let's go ahead and go through this. Let's find the pH after the reaction is complete. So for these find the pH questions, find the excess reactant. If we have a hydroxide and, a, and a, an acid, finding the pH at the end is going to depend on finding the leftover concentration. Because at this point, the only acids we're going to be doing these calculations with are what we call the strong acids. And so strong acids basically are a list of acids that when we, um, when we put them in water, they dissociate completely, meaning they, they react to make hydronium 100% of the time. So with that in mind, if we reminder that that pH, our definition of pH is negative log of hydronium concentration, right? Well, that means that if we're dealing with a strong acid, meaning it dissociates 100% when you put it in water, if we find the final concentration of the acid, that's the same as our final concentration of hydronium. Again, for a strong acid, let me finish the list here. Uh, there's seven that are commonly referred to in Gen Chem. HClO4, and I think it's HClO3. I always forget the seventh one because I only learned the six of them. Um, hydrochloric, hydrobromic, hydroiodic, nitric, sulfuric, perchloric, and chloric acids. These seven, when you put them in water, we can say that our concentration of the acid, which a lot of times we'll just use this as a, as a generic form, any acid when it's got, when it's protonated, uh, when it has that, that H plus still, we just call it HA, it's just a generic acid. If it's one of these seven, concentration of HA is your concentration of H3O plus. So what we're trying to find with this problem is, okay, well, either I'm gonna have leftover nitric acid and I just need to find that final concentration of nitric acid and then I take the negative log of it, or I'm gonna have leftover hydroxide. And if I find the concentration of the leftover hydroxide and take the negative log of it, I'm not finding pH, I'm finding pOH, the other one, right? So pH is negative log of H3O plus, pOH is negative log of hydroxide. What else do we know? If we know pOH, how do we get pH? What else do we know about these two? What was that other equation? They multiplied together. And then if we took the log of that and rearranged it, we could make it look like a simpler equation, right? 14 equals pH plus pOH. And that comes from that multiplying those concentrations together. Or we're always gonna be equal to 10 to the minus 14, right? But this is the more common form. So if we wanna know the final pH at this point, we're always going to be looking for what's my concentration of hydroxide or what's my concentration of H3O plus. The other concentration is not going to be zero, but it's going to be so close to zero that we can just treat it like um, it's zero for the purposes of doing stoichiometry. Basically, we're looking to find that excess reactant and find the concentration of it. 
right? So with that in mind, how do we go about doing that for this reaction? If we have nitric acid and we have a volume and a molarity, we can get to moles, right? 125.0 mLs at 0 0.100 molar. Let's think for a second about what this system is saying. It's saying we're taking three tenths of a gram. So call that like a pinch, like you were doing a pinch of salt. We wouldn't actually add it that way because you don't want to get lithium hydroxide on your skin. Um, but basically we're taking a pinch of salt and we're adding it to, to 125 mLs of a solution, right? So that means before we add this lithium hydroxide, we could find the pH of this solution, right? If we we use that same idea, do we even have to do any stoichiometry at all to find the pH initially? If it's nitric acid, it's a strong acid. We know that our concentration of H3O plus is our concentration of nitric acid, which we have a number for. What is the pH of the solution initially? We're just going to plug it in like that. That one's easy enough. Even I can do it in my head. Log base 10 of 0.1 is negative one, right? So negative, negative one is one. Practice plugging this into your calculator to get one as an answer, negative one as an answer, and then take the negative of negative one. So make sure you know how to use the log button on your calculator, right? Logs are tricky enough without trying to figure out in the middle of the test, how your calculator works, right? So sometimes you type in 0.1 and then hit the log button. Sometimes you push log and then type 0.1. Depends on your on your specific calculator. That's why I want to practice with that. Is everybody comfortable with the, maybe comfortable is the wrong word. Is everybody following the idea that our concentration of nitric acid is the same as our concentration of H3O plus? When you put nitri a strong acid in water, it reacts with the water. The water acts as the base, the strong acid acts as the acid, and you make H3O plus, and in this case, nitrate. And that reaction goes all the way to completion. And you're never going to run out of water in that case. Water is not the limiting reactant. In other words, every mole of nitric acid turns into nitrate and hydronium, which is why we can say that those two concentrations are the same. Again, this only that only applies to um, strong acids. Weak acids are a whole different thing. It turns out weak acid has nothing to do with the pH. Well, it affects the pH, but you can have a weak acid solution with a more acidic pH than a strong acid solution. So we'll talk about weak, what weak means in chemistry terms uh, in a week or two. All right, so we're all comfortable-ish with using our calculators with logs too, right? So now what do we do to figure out excess reactant and what's running out? What do we do with any of these stoichiometry problems? What's always the first step after balancing? 
put everything in moles. Although I suppose we should, it doesn't matter for answering the final question, but we probably should finish the reaction, right? Mm -hmm. Nitric acid acts as an acid. What do we get as the conjugate base? We're going to, that's going to be the conjugate acid when we're done, is going to be the H2O. The nitrate, the nitric acid turns into nitrate. And the hydroxide and the H plus turn into H2O. And then what else is left over? The lithium. So technically it'd be lithium nitrate or lithium ions and nitrate ions floating around. Either way you want to write it would be fine. None of this stuff over here is going to affect the pH, though. The only thing that's going to affect the pH in this case is, do we have leftover uh, hydroxide or do we have leftover strong acid? I think we're getting pretty good at going from volumes and concentrations to moles, right? 125.0 milliliters. For every thousand milliliters, that's a liter. And for every red, it's not pretty. Easy to see. Not sure the purple is much better. For every one liter is 0 0.100 moles. Right, so net result, divide by a thousand, then multiply by 0.1. So should get 0 0.0125 moles. And then if we're taking a solid and adding it in, How do we get from a solid mole or grams of a solid to moles? Molar mass. Same way we've been doing it, right? So three point or point three two five grams. Lithium hydroxide. Hydroxide's about 17. Lithium's about seven. So about what 24 grams is a mole? Something a little bit less. Here's a fun practical fact about uh, hydroxyl. Anybody know what it feels like when you get uh, a, a very alkaline solution on your skin? It doesn't actually. Movie Fight Club would lead you to believe that it's exceedingly painful and it will be eventually. But first, it actually, our, our pain receptors are not actually evolved to handle alkaline solutions very well. I've mentioned the fact that acids are way more common in nature. Um, so we actually have pain receptors that are well adapted to responding and sending pain signals um, when we come into contact with an acidic solution, like getting lemon juice in a cut, right? That hurts a lot. Um, if you get something that's just as basic as lemon juice is acidic on your hand in the same cut, you won't feel it at first. And what will happen instead is your skin gets slippery. Um, that's actually the skin cells dissolving. It actually breaks apart the phospholipid bilayer that makes up your cell membranes and they start just breaking apart. Um, once you get all the way through the epidermis, all the way to the lower skin cells, then yeah, it'll start to really hurt. And you'll, but then you're looking at like third degree burns as it is anyway. It would take a bit. Depends on how, how concentrated the solution is and how much of it there is on your skin. Um, but you, it won't sting the same way that lemon juice does. 
it'll it feels significantly different um and it it's happened to me before it, it doesn't take much it feels like you've got a little bit of dish soap on your skin um don't try that that said i didn't lose any limbs so it's not that dangerous but be careful um and if you feel that in this week's lab just go to a sink the nice thing about these strong acids and strong bases is all you have to do is dilute them and they're harmless so all you do if you get something on your skin is just go to a sink and just immediately wash it off and you're totally fine um so it's not that dangerous as long as it's not in your eyes that's a whole different story okay bleach is fairly basic um it also has an it's also a very strong let's see that would be a um very strong oxidizing agent yeah it's a pretty strong oxidizing agent and that's more what why it kills things it's not that it's basic it is basic but it's more that it's a really strong oxidizing agent turns out biochemistry is even more complicated than regular chemistry because living things are even more complicated than non-living things um so there's a lot of well yes but actually no sort of answers when you ask me biochem questions All right, back to the problem at hand. Is the reaction balanced? Yeah. All one-to-one -one stuff, right? That makes things easy. That actually makes it pretty easy to figure out what's gonna run out first, right? If we know that they're being used up at the same rate, we can just say whatever we have the fewest moles of is our limiting reactant, right? If we wanted to show that, we could say, okay, well, if I've got 0 0.125 moles of nitric acid and every one mole of nitric acid is one mole of lithium hydroxide used. It's looking familiar, right? even easier than the one on the test because the one on the test had a two to one ratio mixed in right if it was a two to one ratio one of these would just be a two though it wouldn't really necessarily be that much trickier if you're showing your work you just have to remember to do that step so 0 0.0125 moles lioh used we have 0 0.0136 moles, which means we're not running out of the hydroxide. So how do we get to our excess, our molarity? Because remember these brackets are molarity. We need molarity of excess hydroxide. We have moles used, moles initial. How do we get to moles left over? Just a quick subtraction. Everybody okay up to this point? Now what do we do? Remember, we're trying to get to pH. We have leftover hydroxide. How are we going to get to pH? This is moles. If we put in moles per liter, we'd have concentration of hydroxide, right? Again, because it's one-to-one, -one. yes, this is lithium hydroxide, but we really know that that's lithium ions plus hydroxide ions, right? So as long as we know our concentration of or our moles of hydroxide ions, concentration of hydroxide ions is just moles per liter, 0 0.0011 moles left divided by what? What's our volume? 125 milliliters. Does that change 
Because water's a product. Not within sig figs. So there are two ways that you could think about the volume changing, right? Either by the fact that we added some solid, but we've talked about that before, how that doesn't really change the volume measurably. Same is true for moles of, of H2O. If, if we did this reaction, we'd be making 0.01 moles of H2O and 0.01 moles of H2O is gonna take up about the same amount of space that the stuff we added over here had anyway. Um, so it's really not going to affect it within sig figs. Molarity of pure water, it's weird, but you can actually calculate the molarity of water in itself, is about 55 moles per liter, which means one mole of water. If we made a whole mole of water, it would still only be about 0.02 liters, which so 20 milliliters, and we're making a hundredth of that. So we're making about 0.2 milliliters of water, which pretty insignificant when you think about it. It's not worth spending our brain power on within sig figs. All right. How do we know what the, that we're using the 125? Because that's our starting solution here, All right? We've done that before. I, I prepped you for this with our stoichiometry practice and solutions, right? They all ended asking about what's the final concentration of the leftovers because we were headed towards pH questions. So what's our final concentration when you actually do that math? 0 0.009 maybe? Eight something? Eight eight. Right, just Oh yeah, that's an eighth. That makes sense. Are we done? Close. Now for the step we haven't done before, right? Which is just from here, we're trying to get to pH. If we had done this problem and we'd had leftover acid, We'd find the concentration of leftover acid, just like we did with hydroxide, take the negative log of it and we're done. Because it's leftover hydroxide though, when we take the negative log of it, of it we get POH. So POH is going to just negative log of 0 0.0088 should be something pretty close to two, something between two and three on closer to two, 2.055. Right, this is re this is pretty close to 0 0.01, right? And if it was 0 0.01, taking the log of it would be negative two on the nose. So since I know it's between um, two, negative two and negative three, if it was 0 0.001, it'd be negative three. So we can estimate logs by doing that if you just know how many decimal places over you are, round to the nearest 10. And that should be kind of close to when, uh, that number of decimal places should be pretty close to your answer when you take a log of it. I can't do logs in my head, but what you can do is say, I know it's between these two numbers. If you get, if you did take a little practice, which is really helpful for those reasonableness checks. Are we done? I mean, might as well be, we're so close. All we have to do now is use this bottom equation. We know pOH, we know 14. So pH is just 14 minus 2.06.
So all that work, and the only thing that's really new was the last two steps, right? Everything else we've done before. The only trick is that we added these three pieces in, right? And that's the part that's the hardest to wrap your head around because it involves logs and logs are scary. And because it's an abstract idea. What is pH? It's just a random thing. It's a number. It has no units to it. What does it really mean? Well, it's not that random. It's just like two steps removed from real reality. If you want to think about it that way. These concentrations are real. These are measurable and they make sense in the sense that any concentration does. But we're just putting them into a log-based unit. Which as annoying as it is, is the standard. So we kind of have to get used to that. Also, if you've done anything with the pH scale before, you might realize that's fairly basic. That's pretty alkaline. Um, you know, something like a, trying to think of where that would even show up in nature. Maybe in some groundwater samples, you might get um, something that's this alkaline occurring in nature, but basically this is to the point where you're not gonna see this occurring in nature. This is something that at this level of alkalinity pretty much only occurs in the lab on earth. Alkalinity is the same, it's an old way of saying basic. Something as alkaline, it's the same as saying it's basic. Alkalinity, basicity sounds weird as a noun, the character of being basic. So alkalinity still gets used that way. So it doesn't sound quite so weird. Um, but the the, uh, the point I was, I was gonna make though is just that that's all, not that concentrated, all things considered, right? We've dealt with a lot more concentrated solutions than that. And that's all it takes to make it so basic that you won't find it in nature anymore. Log-based scales are weird that way. Um, also, can can you have a solution that has what's the what's the range on a pH scale? Zero to fourteen usually is what somebody answers. But is there anything that says that you can't have a negative pH? How would you get a negative pH? If taking the log of your hydronium concentration gives you um, a positive number, you get a negative pH, right? When you're taking logs of something, log base 10 of some log base anything of something, how do you get a positive answer here? Greater than... It's gotta be greater than zero because you can't take log of a negative number, right? That gives you an error on your calculator. If it's greater than one, you get a positive number here. So anytime you've got a solution, a strong acid solution where your concentration of the acid is greater than one mole per liter, that's a solution that's gonna have a negative pH. And those can happen. That concentrated nitric acid, if you get as concentrated as you can get it, it's about 70% nitric acid by mass and the rest of the mass is water. Um, and that has a concentration of 15 moles per liter, which you can take the log base 10 of 15, you'll get something between two and three, right? So that some of the most acidic pHs you can get in a water-based solution are about uh, negative two, to negative three, between negative two and negative three, closer to negative two, frankly. But you can have all that to say, you, just because you get a negative number when you do this doesn't necessarily mean you did it wrong if it's a concentrated solution. If your acid is more than one mole per liter, you should get a negative pH. All right. I just erased that, but let me put that back up. One last thing before we go to the next practice problem. 
what's the concentration of H3O plus? If we got pH is equal to, what was it, one, is it one point? Sorry, 11.94. Well, we got to pOH from the concentration of hydroxide, right? If there's a pH period, then that means there has to be an H3O plus concentration, right? It might just be really small. How do we, how do we get hydronium concentration from the pH? So instead of taking the negative log of hydronium concentration, we're going to undo that. How do we do that? Ten, not quite multiply by 10, 10 to the power. So if we're gonna do negative log of H3O plus, we're trying to solve for that. 10 to the negative log, is that's gonna cancel out. So we wanna do 10 to the power, except we wanna move that negative over first. Start by moving the negative over. I should have done that first. This is the first step. So our hydronium concentration in this solution should be really low because it's a really basic solution, right? 10 to the negative 11.94 is your hydronium concentration, which when you plug it into your calculator, it'll give you a number in scientific notation, right? So to undo the log, you take both sides of your equation and you, you do whatever the base log is, which is 10 in this case, 10 to the power of each side. So it's not quite like saying you're raising it to the 10th power, that's kind of backwards. You're taking 10 and raising 10 to the power of both sides. which again, this is good practice for, for using your calculators, figure out how to type that into your calculator. It's gonna be something like two times 10 to the minus 12. Let's see, 10 carat parentheses, negative 11.94, close parentheses, one point, I get 1.15 times 10 to the minus 12. Um, depending on who you've had for a math teacher, with logs, there's some sort of rule where you do like you draw a circle around the base and bring it to the bottom or something like that. I never learned it that way, so I can't teach it that way. Um, but if you have, if you've been taught some way of undoing logs before, that still applies. I just, like I said, that was not a trick that was ever taught to me. There's something about how you loop it around and bring it to the other side and draw it, draw a circle around it funny. Um, that, but I'm judging by the looks on your faces, you've never seen that either. So ignore that. You get a chance to take a math class with Bruce Armbrust over at the at the college. He's really good. I know he use he teaches with that one, but they're changing what math classes they're allowed to offer. I don't think we're going to be allowed to offer trig pre calc anymore. So I better get better at teaching logs. All right, any questions about this problem that we have now spent almost the whole period, almost the whole hour on random questions in one problem? We didn't need to spend the whole time on one problem, but I was trying to go slow. Here's the other way I ask questions like this sometimes. Complete the box. Find all of them. 
We already did that though, right? We found concentration of hydroxide so that we could get pH, so that we could pOH, so that we could get pH, and then we undid pH to get hydronium concentration, right? So we just did that. This is just one, I can ask it in one question. Find all four of these things for what you get when you mix calcium hydroxide and uh, hydroiodic acid. All right. We're going to leave some of these other practice problems for your assignment for tomorrow. The one, the calcium hydroxide one, this is going to be your, your homework problems to work on with Tom's tomorrow. It's going to be this problem and this problem. I pull, I'll pull them out separately and write them as a PDF and put them as the assignment um, tonight, but we're going to skip them for now. Kai. Oh, you'll have time for that too. Don't work. That all you have to do for that one is just weigh it, right? And and subtract the mass of the paper. So that'll be quick. And then you'll have these two problems as well. And it's only two problems, right? No big deal. Yay. This is why you should never be excited when somebody says it's a take-home test and it's only three problems for your final. Um, because usually that's going to be more time than you would have spent on 10 problems in class. Um, I believe we did a, we, I have done, I have it set up where you do the in-class test. It's like the last one. And then there's a take home portion of it. That's like five problems that are not as bad as I could make them. Um, Again, my, I don't want to dissuade you from taking the Gen Chem class, but the Gen Chem class take home final is five problems that usually takes them around 15 hours over the course of a week. Um, yours is, I believe was two problems last, last semester. And it, I expected it to take them a total of about three hours on the take home part. So about an hour and a half per question. That's doable. And it, the whole point is not to make it so that you can't solve them, but so that if you're bad at taking tests in class, you still get a chance to get some points in the exam category that aren't under a time constraint. But I'm gonna make you work for it. All right, so probably that's the way the final will be set up as well. There'll be 50 points that'll be a take home section and another 100 points that'll be in the, um, that'll be timed as well, okay? No a multi-part problem, but usually it's not because there's a whole bunch of parts that aren't related. It's because you have to do part A to get to part B, use your answer from part A and part B, and then your answer from part B leads to part C. So making it multi-part questions actually makes things easier because you don't have to figure out what the steps are yourself. I'm kind of guiding you through the steps by making it multi-part usually. Um, the worst take home problems, the ones that take the longest, where you could spend hours and hours making zero progress or making negative progress sometimes if you go the wrong direction, um, are the ones where it's just like, here's the reaction. How much product could you get from this? Um, and so you have to do things like, like think about the black hole problem that we did on the, on the homework. Now picture me putting like a percent yield and some stoichiometry where I don't tell you what the products are all of that into one problem. One negative could mess up the whole thing. Or you could say, I think I need to go this route and start working on it. You spend an hour working on it and you realize that you're going the totally the wrong direction. Um, turns out the more you know, the more complicated you realize things are. And the more complicated things are, the trickier it is to answer a simple question. Dash. Yes, but I will only mark you down once. If you do parts B, C, and D wrong correctly with the wrong answer, then I only mark you down for getting part A wrong. And just for fun, because we're talking about it, we can look at just take home real quick. Or last last quarter's take home. It won't be the same numbers. 
Usually it's something along those lines. It'll be a similar problem. So here's the here's this is actually a good example because this is both types of questions. An open-ended one where I don't give you the steps and one that's multi-part. So one is sodium oxide reacts with water to produce sodium hydroxide. Write, write the reaction out. What's the pH of the solution made? So basically what we just did. And then how many milliliters of HCl are required to neutralize all of the hydroxide from part B? So you basically do these, do this in multiple steps to get something like this. this that's not actually that tricky one. It requires a lot of steps. It might take you a page and a half, two pages of writing to show all your work. But that's one everybody will be able to do by the time we get there, especially if you're sitting with your notes. Um, this one's a little bit more tricky because it's open-ended. You make a spherical bubble with a radius of 2.5 centimeters at a depth of 30 meters where the pressure is X. What's the radius of the bubble when it reaches the surface? And I can make that one even trickier because you could say, is anybody, I think the swimmer's already left for the day, but if you, has anybody ever blown ring bubbles? Ring bubbles aren't a sphere, right? They're a torus. So you could actually lose something like, what is the, what is the uh, radius of the torus by the time it reaches the surface? So basically I can make some really, really obnoxiously hard problems that are still based in real world situations if I know how to ask the right questions, All right? What's the hardest like, question you have? Uh, so our, in grad school, our, our in-class tests um, were questions like that, except based on differential equations. Um, and so it was basically, you have two hours to answer three questions and I didn't answer a single one of them correct, but I got close enough on all of them that I still did better than the class average. Um, and yet I didn't get a single one of the three. I don't think I even finished a single one of the three um, because it was so obnoxiously hard. Stuff like the flow rate in a through a tube that goes around a corner, which drops the flow rate around the corner and the flow rate changes based on how close to the center of the pipe you are. Um, it's a differential equations problem. And then you wind up like, okay, so how much product makes it to the end of the tube? Or, and how long does it take to get this much product? Um, it's, it's starts getting to be really, like I said, obnoxiously hard sometimes, uh, University of Colorado in, in Boulder. And that, that's, the, that's more of a chemical engineering problem. If you go more the engineering route, you have to do stuff like flow rates and things like that. What was the longest, the longest, I, in PK, it was probably in PK. Unless you count that organic qualitative final where the full final was, here's here's a white organic powder, what is it? Um, that we had a whole week to do. That's the one I mentioned where if you guessed wrong, if you guessed it right on the first guess, you got 100%. If you guessed it wrong, you got you dropped 10% every incorrect guess. Well, we didn't even take it home. You just had a vial of it and you just stayed. We just spent a whole week basically in the chemistry lab. So it was like a fourth year class. And so it was basically, we had a whole week and the entire chemistry department at my undergrad to go to try and answer that question. That one was like the most fun question, but I probably spent more time on that than any other take home problem, any other single problem. Uh, sort of thing that you get to do when you take four, Take, take more science classes and I'll tell you how you can figure that out, or at least I'll point you the right direction. All right. Um, that's all we really needed to get to today. I just wanted to spend some time on that one problem, make sure we we're feeling good about that. Hey, Martha.